ahead. The Pontiac mourns the loss of two people who died in an early morning fire. It just hurts everybody how they were dying in the flames in the fire. The kind of fire that most rural communities are unprepared to fight. This can happen to any village anywhere. When it comes to fatal fires, what makes Alaska one of the most vulnerable states in the nation? The state of Alaska, in order to save money, is not funding fire departments in rural Alaska. Coming up, what will it take to help communities help themselves as they head into the fire? Alaska, where there are old triumphs, but also new frontiers, with challenges as great as the state itself, but a belief that the best is yet to come, bringing you the faces the places and the spirit of the last frontier. This is Frontiers with Rhonda McBride. Welcome to Frontiers. When fire strikes a building in rural Alaska, odds are it will be reduced to rubble. And if there are people inside, the risk of death is extremely high. In Southwest Alaska this week, we saw a scene all too familiar. Two people died in Napakiak, a community near Bethel on the banks of the Kuskokwim River, where life is full of challenges, especially when it comes to fighting fires. The rain fell like tears in Napakiak. Two young people lived their last moments in this building, which housed the jail. Community members believe they may have been taken here to sober up. They say Isaiah Parka, who was 22, and Becca White, who was two years older, were best friends. Becca's cousin says they'll be missed. They were happy, kind, funny people, always happy, making people laugh. Two guards were also injured in the fire, one so seriously he was flown to Seattle for treatment. Witnesses say the fire burned so hot and so fast, it raged out of control in less than 15 minutes. I tried yelling to see if anybody was in there. It was too hot. The, the flames burned my face and my forehead and my back head, my hair. And, and from, from there, we, we got help and we got the line to the Cusco Quim and we started fighting the fire, taking turns helping with the fire hose. There is a sense of powerlessness in it all and panic. My girlfriend came over to my house and knocked. And then once I opened the door, she started crying and held me hard. Randy Loopy's girlfriend thought he was in the jail, trapped with the others. My brother tried going in too. Once they broke the door, they tried, he tried crawling in. He just made it to that bathroom and he had to turn back. I don't know, just hurts everybody, how, the, how they were dying in the flames, in the fire. Witnesses texted Loopy that they had heard their cries for about 15 minutes. Then they stopped. They say it's hard to pass this building. The smell of the charred wood still lingers, and a sense of loss hangs heavy over the community. And questions about how, why, and worries about what to do the next time fire strikes. Becca White leaves behind a young daughter. The jail guard, Clarence Richteroff, was last listed in serious but stable condition at the intensive care unit at Harborview Medical Center in Seattle. Investigators suspect a mattress in the jail may have been set on fire, but there's no official word on the cause. Since the fire, the Regional Health Corporation has sent grief counselors to Napakiak, and the school district has also sent social workers. Up next, Project Code Red. It was called a fire station in a box, sent out to communities across Alaska. What happened to these firefighting units? why things did not go as planned. Fire safety in rural Alaska, especially for communities off the road system, definitely does not have a one-size-fits-all solution. 
part of why Alaska has one of the highest fire death rates in the nation. About 15 years ago, the state and federal government funded some uniquely Alaskan approaches to fighting fires in rural Alaska, but that effort appears to have fallen by the wayside. Shoot a small little burst of it off to the side just to make sure it's going to work. There we go. Project okay, Code here. Red was rolled out around 2003, built as a fire department in a box that can be towed by a four-wheeler or snow machine. Alaska Village Initiatives believes it gives the state's smallest and most isolated communities the next best thing to a fire station. They actually train them as much as possible to fight it from outside. It was the brainchild of George Quinto and Charles Parker, who designed it for small villages like Napakiak. First thing I thought was, did they have Code Red, and did somebody there know how to use it? This is the Code Red. Napakiak does have a Code Red unit, but during the fire that swept through the jail, it was locked in the shipping container. Walter Nelson doesn't remember when Code Red came to Napakiak, perhaps more than 10 years ago, maybe longer. Back then, he was one of the first to be trained. Most everything was used up. Although the supplies for the unit have run out, Walter says the basic equipment is still good. All the extinguishers, helmet, axes, hoses, uh, shovels are in the on these in these two containers. But Walter and says are, he hasn't had any training since Code Red was introduced and has forgotten what to do. If that structure's on fire, you know, how how do you fight it? Do you break the windows? Do you break the doors? How do you get inside? Had Code Red been maintained, chances are it probably wouldn't have saved the lives of the two people who perished here inside what remains of the jail but it's left many in Napakiak feeling vulnerable. You gotta be really careful. Try to prepare yourself if you wanna protect your family and your property. Since this incident happened, I double checked our fire extinguishers at home and they're actually expired, but they are full, so I'm not sure if they're gonna work. There's a tragedy today, but you know, three, four years down the road, if nothing happens again, it's kind of forgetful until something else happened. They said, oh God, we should have done this, we should have done that. But George Quinto says it's hard to stay vigilant, especially when everything depends upon volunteers. It's a sustainable program only if they had the retraining year after year after year. Quinto says communities like Napakiak have a lot to cope with, from erosion that threatens the school to the lack of running water and sewer service. This well house is the only place in the community where you can get water but you need tokens to buy that water. A dollar will get you about 15 gallons. So even though the well was right next to the jail, when the fire broke out, it was easier and faster to pump water from the river. With the budget crisis, folks said we can't afford a project like this, but at the same time, they spend 50, 60, maybe even 70 million a year replacing assets that burned up in rural Alaska. When for a couple million a year, they could actually protect those assets. Assets like the Kivalina store, a loss estimated at around $60,000, or the Kotlek school with replacement costs of almost three and a half million. But it's those things in life that can never be replaced that Napakiak is thinking about. This can happen to any village anywhere, and we want them to be more prepared to avoid this kind of tragedy that can affect not just this place, but any other small village. Walter Nelson says the community has put together a wish list, and at the very top, more training. These younger folks that are in the community need to be trained. Mm -hmm. You know, the ones that were fi fighting our fire, those were are the guys in our future, new generations that need to know this stuff. A fire like this can be a teachable moment. This is a wake-up call for this community. And not just for Napakiak, but throughout Alaska. State and federal funds for Project Code Red dried up about 10 years ago. About 12 million was spent to get 138 units to rural Alaska, as well as providing the initial training, which hasn't been kept up 
although Alaska Village Initiatives and the State Rural Fire Protection Program will help communities troubleshoot their Code Red units. So joining us now to talk about Code Red, Steve Schreck, who is retired from uh, the State Office of Rural Fire Protection, but you've worked with communities on and off the road system. So let's talk a little bit about Nepakiak and what happened there. What are your thoughts? Uh, anytime there's fire fatalities, it's a tragic, tragic event. The ripple effect from that is huge. You know, family, friends, community, and um, in rural Alaska, you know, losing a couple people in a fire can actually affect that entire region of the state and have an impact on the entire region. Especially if they are like a tribal leader or yes. involved in the community. Well, I'm going to talk about Project Code Red and, and one of the problems in Nepakiak is uh, training hadn't happened. And why is it that, that this couldn't really keep functioning without training, that people just couldn't train each other at some point? Let me give you a brief comparison. If we compare a rural fire department to, say, Anchorage Fire Department, Anchorage Fire Department's the largest in the state, well-equipped, manned 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Their firefighters train every single shift to keep their skills current, to hone their skills, to make sure that they can do it safely, effectively. But what about um, Code Red, though? Why, why does this take upkeep? And we have some photos of people training there, uh, and it sounds like, like it's pretty involved. It is. Firefighting is extremely dangerous. And um, toxic gases, heat, um, so, to train people to do it safely and effectively takes amount of time and takes a team of fire service instructors that understand everything. We developed a 40-hour program for rural Alaska communities um, that's not equipment specific so we can use it in any community regardless if they have Project Code Red or a surplus fire engine or just pumps and hoses. Even a bucket brigade, um, the Office of Rural Fire Protection can benefit them in teaching them how to effectively fight fire. But to train them one time and assume that 10 years later they're going to remember and that that training is going to be effective is just unrealistic. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, the Hooper Bay fire, which uh, was a while back, uh, but it almost you know, wiped out a whole section of the old village. It, it could did. have spread further. Now, Code Red was in effect there. Did that help? Yes. Because there's still a lot of damage in that fire. That is actually a textbook fire for a couple of reasons. They did a very good job. Um, they had gone through training recently before that fire happened, I think within a few weeks. And uh, they put into play what they had taught, been taught the training. Um, the tr fire started in the two schools before anybody noticed. So that fire was fully involved. They responded with the Project Code Red equipment and realized right away that their equipment was not going to put out that much fire. So they dedicated the equipment to saving the critical infrastructure of the community, primarily the successful? tank farm, and they were successful. Oh my God, if the tank farm had gone up. Yes, and oh. so even though they lost 39 structures because of how they managed that fire and what they had, because they implemented what they had been trained to do, nobody got hurt, nobody even got a hangnail on that fire, and so it was very successful in terms of protecting life and they did an amazing job. And on when that you fire. think about protecting life, you know, and that is the priority, you know, what about protecting, you know, infrastructure? And we have some photos from a fire in Lower Kalskag, which had two school fires. They built a new one to replace the old. You know, what's the teachable moment from that? Um, that early detection is critical. Um, having trained responders and um, is critical. Uh, and that I guess the teachable moment is when there's that kind or that level of fire in a community, it's devastating. It's expensive. 
I mean, this and was millions to replace millions these Millions of dollars. It's, it, uh, it impacts the entire community because of education of the kids until the schools rebuild. It's just and lightning struck twice in that community. I want to look at fire fatalities, though. And we have two snapshots from two different periods, the first 2004 to 2008. And this was kind of the impetus for projects like Code Red. And look at those numbers, you know, 24 civilian fire fatalities in 2007. Now, in the next snapshot, we see that the numbers have been reduced in 2013 for example, there were only 16, but they're going up again. So what is the message of, of those two snapshots in time? It's really difficult to look at the numbers for Alaska because we have so many different variables and so many different types of departments between urban and rural. So just to look at numbers specifically kind of gives you a missed message. Um, during Project Code Red, uh, we had two programs running. One was Project Code Red, and the other one was a fire prevention program um, called the Home Safety Improvement Project, which put smoke alarms in people's homes, fire extinguishers. So during those two programs, Project Code Red and the Home Fire Improvement Project, uh, we saw rural Alaska fires decrease rural Alaska fire so fatalities decrease. Two tracks, right? To, yes. To um, make a difference. Yes. And it, uh, it takes the whole community to be involved, to truly have an impact. Um, you know, it's been proved that early detection is critical with people having working smoke alarms in their homes. If we look at fire fatalities, not only in rural Alaska, but across the state, um, one of those key factors in a home fire fatalities is not having a working smoke alarm. So that's really a key component. And making those alarms available to people, keeping those alarms working is a critical component. All right. Well, we'll have to leave it there, but I want to thank you very much, Steve Schreck. Thank you. Hope you're enjoying your retirement. <laughs> <laughs> well, up next, the Alaska State Fire Marshal. Richard Boothby has his work cut out for him. What kind of help can rural Alaskans expect in these budget tight times? Funding for rural firefighting will continue to be a big challenge at both the state and federal level. And joining us to talk about how communities can prepare themselves, Richard Boothby, the state fire marshal. You know, I'm sure that after this this fire in Napakiak that you must have a lot of thoughts about things and you know one of the things that occurs to me is boy it was very dangerous for people in that community to try to rescue uh, the victims inside they didn't get in but what are your thoughts about how that was handled given their limited resources? I think the village did a, a wonderful job um, and that's typically what we find throughout Alaska um, uh, the people in those small communities always pull together no matter what and, 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 and get it done. Uh, firefighting is a very dangerous business. Um, in the sense, what they did um, was they knew they needed to protect the infrastructure to the sides of it, and, and they concentrated there, and um, they did a, a great job at what they did. But you're given the limited resources, and this, this really shows uh, what, what the state can provide, What's your department going to do to, to make a difference and, and perhaps help uh, doing more with less, I guess? <laughs> That's a good question. Thank you. Um, so we have the Office of Rural Fire Protection, and um, that's what they specialize in is, is those smaller communities. And um, we bring them in for training to, to Palmer every year. Um, when we have situations like just happen, it always makes us sit back and, and, and reevaluate on how and what we're doing and, and what we could do in the future. Um, also, it, it brings it to the forefront, so um, hopefully it will change in funding streams potentially. When people realize um, there's a situation or issue, um, it brings a lot of people to the table to talk about it. Uh, through those collaborations, uh, we always come up with something uh, we hope that it'll be better, uh, faster, um, to provide a need for that community. So it, these are opportunities for teamwork. But I do want to talk about fire fatalities because, yeah. you know, we've seen these numbers inching up, except, mm -hmm. uh, of course, 2018, it dipped back down again. But uh, this year, 
you know, we're already at 10 fatalities. The average in a given year is about 15, so we're not even halfway through the year. Does this concern you? Um, yes, each and every fatality concerns us. Um, we, through the fire marshal's office, we have um, what we call our enforcement, our education, and then our engineering, the plan reviews. Uh, we're always, every year, uh, evaluating the fires we have, uh, the deaths, and trying to figure out where in there can we break that chain or can we assist in that chain to make a difference in, in people's lives and, and property. Um, so we're always evaluating that in, in, in trying. Um, we've, we've done many, many programs and we see um, always a reduction. And so then what there's about Code Red? Do you think that you'd like to see that come back? Um, there were some very good parts to Code Red. Um, the training, the community has taken responsibility in, in doing that for themselves. Um, I, I think it's a, an awesome opportunity. Um, we just have to figure out how to, to uh, continue that funding stream for it. It always seems that it always goes back to, to a money uh, issue when you, you get to those rural communities. Well, I do want to talk before we run out of time about urban versus rural, and, and uh, we actually have some numbers from, mm -hmm. from your office looking at how you define a rural or urban department. Could you explain that to us? What makes rural? Like is Bethel rural, Kotzebue rural, Seward, do you consider them rural? No, none of the, uh, neither of those are. Um, rural to us, we go back to level of training. So they train to what's called a firefighter one standard, which is uh, more of an interior type firefighting. Uh, the smaller communities in Alaska that don't train to that standard less than that uh, is what we would consider rural. When you look at, at, at Bethel, uh, Seward, uh, Kotzebue, they train to that higher level. They have a tax basis that uh, provides that level of funding so they can sustain that. And that goes back to our rural communities that not always have those, those funding streams to continue that. So they're at a very basic level. So let's look at some numbers that, that also come from your office that, that look at the difference in fatalities between rural and urban. And on the surface, you know, 156 uh, fatalities versus uh, 57 in, in rural Alaska, you know, of course, there's a bigger population, but when you look at the death rate, it's actually much higher in rural Alaska. Can you explain that? Yes. So when uh, you're looking at those numbers, remember that we had to break it down into to groups. So that is a group of 500 people. So in the rural versus non-rural, what you're looking at in, in the rural, that is 3.37 people. Okay. And then at the non-rural, you're just under one. So uh, we are losing rural. Uh, folks faster, if you will, or more of them in that smaller group. Well, that's a really important distinction to make because I don't think people realize wh what an impact uh, this causes. It's huge. Um, and, and uh, you know, there's always those ripple effects to it that go throughout the community and, and through the state. And, and uh, All right. Well, I want to thank you very much. Uh, thank you. We'll have to talk more about these issues in the future. Well, wherever you live, fire protection is definitely not something to take for granted, especially in communities that are off the road system. For more on rural fire safety, you can check out our web extra segment in the Frontier section of KTVA.com. But we want to leave you with photos of St. Paul Island's annual Russian Orthodox Easter egg hunt. And we want to thank Jill Freitas at KUHB Public Radio Station for sharing them with us. And we want to thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week.